Hi, my name is Nancy Fulton, and this is a presentation on merchandising and monetizing your intellectual property. The first thing is you'll discover what kind of content you can turn into merchandise, and you'll also learn which companies are easy to work with and which will allow you to create new products and sell new products without um, charging upfront fees. And you'll find out why merchandising and monetizing makes your work easier to support and allows you to create a more profitable business. Next step is to sort of talk about um, business models. So when you start a business, your objective is to make money. And every single business is a machine that manufactures money. A lot of times people don't see businesses that way and it makes it much harder for them to make a profit. So if you see a business as a machine, there are a bunch of inputs that you use to create your product. Then you sell your product and you take the revenue. And if there's enough profit, you can pay yourself and you can reinvest the money back into your business. That's called a business model. And in this particular example, we're going to talk about books and films as different, kind, as different kinds of businesses, but very similar in the sense that they both are based on intellectual property. Now, when most people think about starting a business, what they decide to do is they think, well, I really want to produce a film and I really have something important to say. So I'm going to produce this film and then I'm going to sell this film and then I'm going to make a profit and pay back all the pay myself for the time and effort that I've invested. Sometimes they decide that they're going to invite investors into the process as well. And their hope is then that they'll make enough money to pay themselves and their investors. Well, the truth is that many people who think that way don't, aren't really thinking big enough. When you create a business, you need to be thinking not just in terms of one film or one book, but in terms of creating a profitable enterprise that can run for years and years and can create multiple products that it sells. Um, that is unless you're choosing to, uh, unless you're on some sort of mission. You know, sometimes people create products and services because they have something they feel is very important to do just one time. Like you may only have one story in you. You may want to create just one documentary. Um, there are some people that, that aren't really trying to create a business. They're not trying to do this over and over again. They just have one thing they want to want to say. Um, and if that's the case, then, you know, more power to you. Basically what you're creating is a, is not a business so much as a work of art. It's something that you're going to produce once and then you're going to sell. I mean, I don't think Vincent van Gogh was trying to create a business. <laughs> he was just producing content that he cared about and you're welcome to do that. But you know, it, it kind of turns into the starving artist thing pretty quickly. If your objective is to be able to work in the entertainment industry or produce movies or be a successful author, you have to sort of think bigger and longer term than that because you need to be able to create revenue that year after year after year pays your bills. Now, if you take a look at the screen, you can see that this is a better business model for a film, right? Describes a more a smarter business model for filmmakers. And basically it says that you should take the inputs, production, name, talent, marketing, and distribution agreements, and you should use it to create books and toys and films. Or it doesn't, you know, you, you may be producing a product for adults, so you may not want to produce toys, but you may want to produce calendars, you may want to produce diaries, you may want to produce coffee cups. There's a million products that you could create, or the film that you're creating is a documentary about eating more healthy. There might be t-shirts, there might be sweatshirts. There's a million products that you could create based upon your intellectual property. You could sell that content, your film, as, as a film, and then you can also sell the products that you've created as well. All of the revenue that you generate will be substantially more than if you literally just produced and sold a single film. And ideally, it would make it so that you generate enough profit to p that you could pay yourself well, and you could repay any investment that was given to you, and furthermore, you have to have enough money invested to go back and put into your next project. If we look at a book business model, the first thing to understand is that a lot of times authors really spend quite a number of years producing a book. And they like to produce more books. They'd like to make a living from producing their books. But because they think only in terms of books, they make it much harder for themselves to produce an adequate living for themselves. So you may, I would suggest, perhaps you consider authoring your first book with a thought toward what your sequels are going to be. And you may also want to create toys if it's a children's book 
or coffee cups or all kinds of other things that go with your book. And you may even think about the fact that someday you want your book to become a film. The vast majority of films these days that are very profitable tend to come from existing works of art like comic books, like graphic novels, like regular novels, like books. So it's not unwise for an author to think that far down the track. I'm writing a book and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to think after the book is finished, I'm going to figure out if I can pitch the book to producers. And that'll actually be easier if you've demonstrated that people like the characters in your book enough to buy a coffee cup that comes with them, you know, or a calendar or a diary or a book of magic spells if you happen to be doing something fantasy related. In a better book business model, you might author your first book, thinking, keeping in mind what you want to do for sequels, toys, films, and other products. You would generate money from publishing the book and then subsequently generate money from licensing deals um, for film and for other products. You would take the revenues. You would pay yourself. And if you have investors that have put money into, for example, if you decided to produce your film yourself, you repay any investors, which usually authors don't have, which is good, actually. Um, and, the, and you'll have enough money to pay yourself to go back and author your next book. So my only point in pointing out business models is so that you understand that when you think about producing a book or a film, you stop thinking in terms of just producing the book and the film, and you start seeing the, seeing the intellectual property that's embodied in those objects as something that you can also exploit. Now let's talk for a minute about the term merchandising. Merchandising is the art of turning things into products, right? Into merchandise. So it might be creating t-shirts or coffee cups or baby clothes or toys, a million, you know, card games, a million different kinds of products can be created from intellectual property. And to create merchandise, you basically need to know who your audience is and why they like your product, right? So you need to be smart enough to realize that if, you're, if you happen to own the Harry Potter book, um, that people really like the wizard part. <laughs> they really like the magic part. And they really like Hagrid. He's a great character. And they like Harry Potter and they like Hermione, you know? So you need to figure out what the elements are that people like in your book or are going to like or are likely to like. Now, I mentioned that not every single book or film lends itself to easy merchandising. And that's something to think about when you're investing your time. Instead of creating just one idea for a book or one idea for a film, it might make sense for you to think in terms of what are all the things that I could write? What are all the things that I could produce? And then invest your times in the ones that are easy to merchandise, right? So you don't have to choose to do something that's, that's less profitable first. You could choose to do something that's more likely to be profitable, that's easier to merchandise first. And then if you have a, a project that is less easy to merchandise, you can do that second. You know, you'll have more money then, so it'll be easier for you to do that less profitable thing. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is what exactly are you merchandising? What exactly are you turning into products? And the answer is intellectual property. And let's just take a moment. A lot of people get into the film and the book industry without really thinking about intellectual property at all. <laughs> so, which is a crazy thing to do because when you're a filmmaker or a book author, what you're creating is intellectual property. That's exactly what you are manufacturing. Now, intellectual property comes in a billion forms. And for example, a filmmaker, he's creating a film, but in order to create the film, He's purchasing the script or writing the script. He's gathering, he's, he's purchasing, uh, sorry, purchasing the rights to the music. He's purchasing artwork and designs from his art director and his set designer, he's, his costume designer. He's producing the right um, to use an actor's performance. He's purchasing, uh, purchasing all of these pieces to create the intellectual property of the film. And the reason it's important for a filmmaker to understand that he's in the business of acquiring and packaging intellectual property and that he should think beyond just creating a film is when he writes the contracts with the actor or when he's writing the contracts with the art director or the, writing the contracts with a costume designer. If he knows, if he's thinking in terms of merchandising, he 
make sure that the contract that he writes acquires all of those rights, not just for the film, but across all media for, or, and, 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 you know, with merchandising um, thought of. Like, he, he makes sure that he acquires all of the rights legally that he needs in order to merchandise the, the work that he's purchasing, right? So he doesn't just write a contract that says, I'm just licensing uh, your image and likeness and your performance for this film. He actually makes a deal with the actor that says, in addition to using the work in this film, I want you, the, the right to use your performance and your rendition of this character for any other purchase, any other purpose, including merchandising. So if I want to make a t-shirt or a shampoo bottle that looks like my character that you happen to be performing, I want the right to do that. George Lucas did that with Star Wars, and that was why it was so successful for him financially. He didn't make a lot of money on the film, but he made a hell of a lot on the merchandising. And that is why you can buy shampoo bottles that look like Princess Leia, right? That's why you can buy little dolls that look like Han Solo. It's because he acquired all of those rights initially when he produced the first film. Authors need to be aware that they're producing intellectual property, and they need to make sure that they don't give away the rights that they've created in their intellectual property by working with other creators. So let's say, for example, you, you write a book like Harry Potter and you have a whole bunch of characters that you describe. You wanna make sure that you are not, by hiring an artist to draw a picture of your character, that you're not giving away the character. So that after that, the artist is the one who actually owns that image and can actually put it on coffee mugs, not you, which means that you need to make sure that when you hire um, artists to draw your book or to draw the cover and so forth, you have to make sure that you purchase all rights in all media for any purpose instead of just purchasing those rights for the cover alone. And the next thing we need to talk about is the fact that intellectual property is as real as physical property. Good intellectual property, which really is property created out of thin air, good intellectual property is as real as, you know, the Empire State Building. And I can prove that to you by saying Mickey Mouse is a pretty darn important piece of intellectual property. The character of Mickey Mouse was used to build a theme park and hundreds of films and, and an entire empire, which we call Disney. <laughs> so Disney is a whole kingdom, literally a kingdom built on intellectual property. So it's extremely real. So are the Marvel comics, which are being used to produce almost every film in Hollywood, it seems like, you know, uh, the, the X-Men series and the, <laughs> the Avengers, all of those are intellectual property as well. So intellectual property is an incredibly real thing. And when you create it, it has real value. And the more time and effort you are planning to invest in your work, the more important it is for you to secure, your, secure the intellectual property rights and make sure that when you hire others to work with you that you're not giving away those rights to them because they've worked with you. And we'll talk about that in a second. So let's talk just for a minute about intellectual property rights. There are four kinds of protections that you need to be aware of. The first is patents. Chances are for this discussion, Unless you're creating some sort of new drone technology, <laughs> you're not going to get, <laughs> you know, like camera drones, uh, you're not going to get a patent because a patent is basically uh, a piece of intellectual property protection that you register with the United States government. You file documents with the United States government and it describes a machine or um, a process like how to create a, uh, aluminum or how to Amazon's one click is a patented thing you're not going to be registering any patents for the most part unless you're doing something mechanical but you are probably going to be registering a trademark at some point or a service mark and let's talk for a second about what those are a trademark is a symbol that you apply to your work such that over time people get to recognize it and every time they see that symbol they think of you now, the reason a trademark is important is when you start, if, when you define a trademark, when you pay for a trademark, you're the only one that's actually allowed to use that symbol. You can, you can sue people who choose to use that symbol who are not you. That's very valuable. If you're going to spend 5, 10, 20, 30 years producing something, 
then getting a trademark on it is a really wise thing to do. You know, there's a huge number of trademarks that are registered that are character names. There's a huge number of trademarks that are um, product names that you're very familiar with, like Kleenex. Kleenex is actually a trademark. So nobody else can call their product, nobody else can call their product Kleenex. A service mark is exactly the same thing, only it identifies a service that you provide. So a service mark might be, um, let's see, rotor router is probably a service mark. It's a, rotor router is a different kind of plumbing service. It's a uniquely named plumbing service so that when you look up in the phone book, the word rotor router, you're getting people that use their procedures and protocols for doing plumbing. So trademark and service mark are registrations that you can use to create a brand that specifies this is, I'm the only one that can do this service. So if you want this kind of service, this level of service, if you want, if you want this character, I'm the only one that can provide it to you. Trademarks and service marks. The next form of intellectual property protection, which is the most strong in the whole world, you know, it's the, the strongest form of intellectual property protection on the entire planet is the copyright. And let's just take a moment and talk about what a, what a copyright is and what it means. If I get a piece of paper and I write a paragraph or two, I own a copyright on that work the instant that I've captured it in a tangible media. So copyright is created the second somebody captures something in a tangible media, which includes a recording, it rec uh, includes a video, it includes a, uh, any text that you may have written, it could be, uh, pictures that you may have drawn, anything that you've captured in a tangible media is the second that it's captured is owned by the person that created it. And I wanna just take a moment to mention that includes if you pick up a camera and you take a photo of something, you own the copyright to that photo. You may not be able to distribute it because it may be a picture of a private person and that private person has certain rights as well. But, but the photograph you own. Now, there's a couple of interesting things to understand about copyright. The first one is that the person who creates the media owns it. So that means when you have, if you're a filmmaker and you hire someone to shoot your film, the film, the, he, the person that shoots the film, the guy standing behind the camera, even if it's your camera, owns the film, unless your contract says otherwise. It's important to understand what that means. It means that you have to have contracts with your, the people working on your project that say that anything they do belongs to you. And you own all rights and all media for any purpose. If you don't have that, then the fact that you've asked them to do something, you know, if I, if I get my cameraman to the set and I'm too lazy to make sure that he's signed all of the appropriate con contracts and he shoots my film with me, for me, without signing all the appropriate contracts, he owns the film. I'm not allowed to distribute it. Even, and that can be true even if I've paid him something, it won't matter because I'll, I, won't, I, I don't have a contract with him that says I own all rights and all media. So, Copyright protection is very important. You need to get contracts with people that say that you actually own their content. You know, if they, and that same is true if an author hires somebody to draw, the, draw their characters and create a book. Even if you have paid that guy, unless he has signed a document that says you own all that content in all media for any purpose, he owns those rights or he owns some of those rights and you may not know which ones. And the second that your thing has economic value, if you try to go back to those creators and say, well, now this is worth money and I want you to sign this document, they're gonna say, well, you have to pay me more because you're buying more rights. And you, you can say, well, that's not what I intended. And they're gonna say, yeah, well, there was a contract or there wasn't a contract and that was your choice. So here we are. Now, there's a couple, another thing you need to understand. So even though you're creating, even though the content it is cop covered by copyright the second it's created. If you don't register your work and the work that people create for you at the copyright office, you can have a problem because you, if somebody starts violating your copyright, you'll have to prove that you own it. 
Now, if it's registered at the Copyright Office, you can basically contact the Copyright Office, say, you know, send me the registration for this thing. And they'll say, okay, here it is. Send it, and they'll send you it. And you can actually go to court and say, look, I've registered the Copyright Office. I actually do own this work. He's violating it. And you're entitled to statutory damages. That means you don't have to prove that they've cost you money. You just get money right away because they violated your copyright. There's a certain set of statutory damages that apply the second that you prove that you registered something at the copyright office and that this person and someone has violated that copyright. And those are pretty can be pretty lucrative, those statutory damages. So it's really worthwhile to register your book and your screenplay and your moot film and all of your other artistic works at the copyright office. Furthermore, the first person to register it at the copyright office wins. So if you know, you're, you've got a book that you've written and you've hired someone to, to illustrate it, and then they, they get the, their illustrations to the copyright office before you do, and then later on they sue you and they say, well, yeah, I registered the copyright. You better have a contract that says, yeah, well, you did that. I actually own that intellectual property. I registered it too, and I have a work for hire agreement. So you actually violated the law by uploading that work to the copyright office. The reason that all of this is important is that you need to make sure that you've secured the rights for your work before you, before you can merchandise it. And it doesn't really matter what you're merchandising it as. Even the, even the distributors will insist that your film be registered at the copyright office. And they'll actually be pretty interested in the fact that you've got contracts <laughs> with all those other people. The E and O insurance, errors and emissions insurance, is something that distributors require you to buy which means that if you've made a mistake in any of your contracts um, and the insurance company will cover to make sure that the distributor doesn't have to pay any damages because they've violated your art director's um, rules or your actor's, your uh, copyright or your actor's rights or whatever. My point being, make sure that you get your copyrights registered at the copyright office, which you can do at copyright.gov. Now, there's one more form of intellectual property protection you need to be aware of which are trade secrets. Trade secrets are recipes or formulas and processes. They, a lot of times, for example, Coke is a trade secret. And the only reason that trade secrets are worth knowing about is the fact that they're the weakest form of copyright protection. Because let's say that you and I are working together and we come up with a recipe or some way that we do things. And I can't cover it with a patent and it's not coverable by copyright because it's not, you know, it's not something that's captured in a tangible media. And it's, or it's, it's like a recipe like if, if you and I come up with a recipe for a new soft drink, I can't, you know, I can ha make you sign a trade secret agreement, which says if you violate the trade secret agreement, I can sue you and these are the damages that you'll have to pay. But if you do violate those, um, those, uh, that agreement and you give the thing away to other people, I can't really do anything about them using the recipe. I just, there's no way for me to, to punish them because they don't have a contract with me. So trade secrets are the weakest form of copyright protection, right? You can only punish the person that signs the contract. You can't punish anybody else. There's a couple of other um, more exotic protections you need to be aware of. Right of publicity and personality rights are rights that actors have and private citizens have. And you, when you sign, when you have an actor sign a release to, um, when you have an actor sign a release, what they're really doing is they're, they're giving up their right of publicity and their personality rights to whatever the, based on whatever the contract says so that you can actually release your film showing those people, right? So the right of publicity and personality rights also protect your next door neighbor. So like if she has a habit of getting undressed, you know, in front of an open window and you set up a camera and you want to show that the work, you know, you want to publish the work online, she can sue you because you violated her um, right of publicity and her personality rights. She has a right to exploit her own image and her own um, performances. You don't have a right to do that for her without compensating her and without getting her contracts and um, agreements in advance. Privacy rights um, protect people against just in that same circumstance I just described. She also has private privacy rights. She has a right to say, I don't want to be seen and you've stolen my image and you better not do that again. And uh, as authors need to be aware of both authors need to be both aware of privacy rights 
and libel and slander rules because basically they prevent you from saying mean things about people that are either private citizens who have a right to do whatever the hell they want as long as they're not breaking the law or um, saying mean things about people that are not true, right? So I think I want to um, take a moment to say I'm not an attorney, but I think, and but I, there are links in the document that go with this video that review, have the links will talk about um, some of the rights that I've reviewed. And then you can look up the rights, like right of publicity and personality rights to learn more online. If you're going to be either an author or a filmmaker, you really do have to have a strong understanding of intellectual property rights in order to protect yourself. And you need to work with a lawyer to get the contracts together that people have to sign in order to protect your work. And you also need to understand, have a good understanding of what your business model is going to be for your project so you get the right rights. Either that or get, you know, always make everybody sign a right um, agreements to give up absolutely everything, which may be slightly more expensive, but it means that in the future, you can't be prevented from creating coffee cups or calendars or aprons or whatever you want from the characters that you um, have created or brought to the screen. Now, the, I wanna talk, the, the document that goes with this download has a huge list I think it's like 30 or 40. It's like a huge list of people that you can work with to merchandise your work. I'm going to start by introducing you to nine that I like. I think everybody needs to be aware of. And then I'm going to leave you to look at the rest of the resources on your own because I think that's, uh, there's so many to go through and <laughs> there's only so long this video can be. So let's just talk about the, the um, first nine. The first one I wanna to talk to you about is one called Smashwords. Now, if I come here and I click on Smashwords, this does not look like a particularly wonderful site, does it? I mean, you don't really sit here and think, wow, this is the end all and be all on the internet. But the truth is that Smashwords is totally amazing. You can feed this thing a cover and a Word document file, and it will release your book on iBook, Barnes and Noble's Nook, and a whole bunch of other ebook platforms, including ScribD. All of those things, uh, you'll a lot of times earn 60, 70%, even 80% royalties on books that get sold through Smashwords. So it's a very lucrative, high, high royalty way to distribute your book. I mentioned in passing, your book can have images, it can have, uh, as well as text, and it can have links that go to your website. So Ebooks are pretty cool because you can create very sophisticated products, and this lets you distribute those products across a wide variety of um, ebook platforms. So you can go to Smashwords and you can click on Publish, and if you click on FAQ, it'll sort of run down what the uh, what the services that they provide. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is Amazon, uh, kdp.amazon.com, kdp.amazon.com. Now, Amazon's Kindle is the most popular ebook platform in the world. Be publishing on Kindle is a pretty important thing to do. Like Smashwords, posting your book, making your book available through Kindle is free. So you basically upload the Word doc and you upload the, the cover and voila, you have a book. You get to set the price, and you can earn 30% 30, 30 to 70% of the revenue generated. CreateSpace.com is a division of Amazon. It lets you print, it lets you do print-on-demand books that are sold through Amazon.com. So once again, you're going to upload a Word document file, and then you're going to upload a cover and you're gonna put in the description and you're gonna specify where you want the book sold, whether you want it sold just on Amazon or in bookstores or libraries, et cetera. So, so if you take a look at um, the book formatting options, just go to createspace.com, uh, log in with the user ID and password that you use to access Amazon or create a new user ID and password, and then you can click on publish a trade paperback. You can also publish music through these folks. 
I don't know how many people do, but you certainly can. And if you want to produce CDs and sell them through Amazon, this is a good way to do it. And also you can release films through CreateSpace. So if you have produced a film and you found no other way to distribute it, go to createspace.com and follow the instructions for doing DVD on demand and Amazon instant video. It's within a week or two, your thing will be available for sale. And that means that you can start promoting it and you can start earning revenue from it. So there's a lot of people that have previously produced films that are just not doing anything with it. And it really doesn't make any sense. There's create space, go put the thing up there and start making it available for sale. As long as you have all of the rights that you need to do that. Now, For those people that are actually producing video on a regular basis, I recommend that you take a look at PivotShare. I use PivotShare. In fact, right now, most likely you're watching this video on PivotShare. <laughs> and the reason that I like PivotShare is that you create the video and you upload it to the channel and you, uh, you can make it available for sale, which means people can download it. You can make it available for rent or people can subscribe. And you said all of the prices and so forth uh, for that operation. So hold on one second. Just sort of move this down so I can click. Um, boom. Right. Oops, sorry. Click. So as you can see, here's my things here. And you, you know, you can rent and you can sell and so forth. The nice thing about uh, pivot pivot space, sorry, pivot share is that you can go ahead and make your product available for sale instantly. You know, it's like you basically create the video and you post it and then it's done. The other thing is that it also allows you to, to create documents that go with the video, which if you're going to do any kind of video training or if you want to pair um, any kind of printed media or any kind of poster images or whatever with the product, the video, you can do that. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is um, a company called Zazzle.com. So previously we've been talking about um, publishing books and um, publishing video. And let me just take a moment to say that if you're producing a film, why would you not produce a book? Chances are you've purchased the rights. I mean, if, you, if, if the rights to the book aren't owned by the author who wants to keep them, for every movie, or every documentary, there should be a book. You've created all of these photos and all of this text and all, you have all this stuff. You might as well go ahead and produce a book with it, right? I mean, how hard is it to put together a nice looking Word doc for, you know, to turn into a book on Smashwords and Amazon? So there is really almost no reason not to produce a book if you've gone to the trouble of producing a movie. <laughs> it takes like two days, you know? And the thing is, you'll probably earn more off the book sales than you do off the, the video sales. I mean, I'm not joking here. Like, you know, you can, you know, you, if you sell the, 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 a print book, you know, for $15, you know, you might make four or $5 every single time the book is sold. And if you think about it, a lot of people who watch a movie might like to get more in depth information from a book, right? Or they might like to have, you know, have the photographs in an ebook, right? I'm just saying, <laughs> there's really no reason not to produce a book if you're producing a movie. You've gone to all this trouble. Um, now, if you're looking at, so I mentioned that because it, now we're looking at Zazzle, we're talking, we're talking about the things that are not books and not movies. You're talking about actually creating objects that people can buy. And it might be pillows, it might be blankets, it might be coffee cups, it might be um, just posters. It could be an infinite number of things. So if you go to Zazzle.com, here's a list of all the different kinds of things that you can create. And what you're going to do is upload, you're going to select a product and you're going to upload the image that you want to use, which is why it's important that if you are an author and you've hired an artist to work with you to create images of your characters, it's important that you own those images for use in all media for any purpose. So, for example, you can say, I want to create a hoodie. Right, and here's the standard hoodie, and then look, you can put a picture on it, just like this, okay? Now, it costs nothing to create products through Zazzle. There's no reason not to create products through Zazzle, and you, you specify the price, 
and you specify how much people you and which much you specify what you're going to earn each time something is sold. Now I want to be clear. You're not going to end up producing the cheapest prod products through Zazzle, right? So, you know, you might spend 30, the, the, the products you produce like a sweatshirt might cost 30 or $40, but the people that are buying your products, the reason they're buying them is not because they want a cheap sweatshirt. They're buying it because they like the message that's on the sweatshirt. They like it because it's the only place that they can get that message, right? So, if, if I like Harry Potter and the only way to get a Harry Potter um, sweatshirt is to get buy, buy it from wherever J.K. Rowling has made it available to me, I'm going to pay that amount because I want that sweater, right? The only reason I mention it is sometimes people go, well, you know, but who's going to buy a $50 sweater? Well, <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> if you've got good enough characters, people will spend that much in order to get, you know, get the merchandise that has the right logos on it as people who come people spend a lot for x-men and star trek and star wars and all kinds of other merchandise so if your content is good enough you can certainly get them to spend um a reasonably premium amount for what they're buying from you and you know sometimes if the coffee cups you might buy for like 12 or 15 dollars or something like that so it really depends you can choose to what products you make available and you which will set the price range so a competitor to zazzle.com is i think it's called redbubble and once again you can have clothing you can have iphone and ipad cases you can have stickers, you can have wall art, you can have uh, uh, pillows, stationery, backpacks, and so forth, an infinite number of things. And once again, you design the products and then you can make them available for sale through your website or you can make them available for sale. You can just have links that you promote. Now, Another thing that you might want to, and I mentioned these people in specific because anybody that's doing a kid's book or anybody that's doing a, any training based thing might find this useful. If you go to makeplayingcards.com, you can actually produce playing cards based upon your, uh, your intellectual property. And you can make playing cards, which are just decks of playing cards, or you can also make games, just like the games that kids are playing all, of, all the time these days. You can also make flashcards. So let's say, for example, you, you have created a, a new training program that teaches people how to be, to get past writer's block. Well, you could create card decks with writing prompts, right? Or you could create, uh, you could create a game that people can play at your workshop or and after they leave your workshop that simulates their ability to come up with new stories you know basically you pick three cards and you have to tell a story that's based upon those three cards so makeplayingcards.com is useful i mentioned in passing that they don't do print on demand and i haven't found a really good playing card print on demand crowd but you can but they'll do it you can buy the cards one at a time so you could place a link on your website that says click here to buy playing cards you know, and they, they might give you 20 or 30 bucks for your playing cards. Um, you know, and, and by the way, you can have more than 52 cards in a deck. So you might have, you know, you might have sell people 100 card decks that cover, that deliver writing prompts or a writing game or something like that. And in which case it might make, nobody might think that was a bad thing to pay 25 or 30 dollars for. So but you could put a link on your website that says buy this deck of playing cards or this deck of game, this game to play. Um, and then whenever they place the order, you could go here and tell these people to print it and ship it to them. They call that drop shipping. If, if, if I can go to this site and say, print this product and send it to those people, that's called drop shipping. Now, um, another thing I mentioned in passing is Seattle Clouds is a website that allows you to create iPhone and Android apps, and it's about as hard to use as WordPress. So it's very easy to create the apps. You can have up to five apps. You can produce up to five apps for $57. <laughs> That's just $57 a month, but you use their, their tool. You create the iPhone and Android app, and then 
you would become an iPhone developer or an Android developer and you would make your um, app available for sale. Now, you're saying to yourself, who on God's green earth <laughs> would want to produce an app? <laughs> and I'll be telling you, if you're a filmmaker, really, <laughs> pretty much every movie could do better with an app. And the reason is that if, as soon as you know you're going to produce a film, like let's say as soon as you've got it funded, you might as well go produce an app. You know you're going to be marketing the stupid thing. So you might, if you produce an app and you go and start promoting the app, you can put images and little video clips from, from about, you know, the talk about the script that, that show um, images from your art director and your costume designer, have interviews with your characters. You can create this thing that anyone who's the least bit interested in your film, as you start to promote it, can go download. And you can collect their contact information and you can say, hey, you know, let us give you an alert when the, when the movie is available to watch in a movie theater or when the movie's available on uh, Amazon or on Netflix or on Hulu. So you start gather, it makes a place that you can put content that people want and that in order to get that content, they have to allow you to contact them later. And when you use an app to do that, instead of collecting their email address, you make it so that spam filters can't stop you from reaching them. Furthermore, that app, makes it so that if you produce a sequel to the film, you can let people know through your app. <laughs> okay. So you need an app if you're producing a film. I'm, I'm sure you do. <laughs> you should definitely go check these people out. Now I mentioned in passing that I've produced, I've produced an app through Seattle clouds for Android in about, well, well under a week, I would say about three days. <laughs> I mean, like from, I wanted to create an app till it was available for sale on Google Play. Apple takes a little bit longer to approve things. So uh, you might expect to spend a month before your app would be available on iPhone. But my point is that it's easy to create apps and you need to be aware that it costs, these people cost $57 a month to release your app. And they've got a whole bunch of features and it's a full native app. And there's no reason not to produce an app. <laughs> so you should do it, okay? So, I mean, if you go to the trouble of producing a film, you're going to spend $3 million on a film, by God, you can afford to spend $57 a month on the best marketing tool you'll have for your film. Now, the uh, next thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, something called Gumroad. So if you want to gather up a collection of files and you want to be able to sell them to people, Gumroad is a great solution. So in the example that I talked a, a little bit ago, when I said, you know, let's say you create a workshop for creative people and you have a set of course materials, which may include audio and video. And um, you can use video, uh, Viv, sorry, you can use pivot share to sell the audio and video together as a package. But if there's other things that they need, you may decide, well, I'd rather use Gumroad because Gumroad will let you gather up literally any kind of file, spreadsheets and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it will let you package it. Um, and sell it as a product. Once again, it's free, and once again, you, you collect 85% of the revenue. So Gumroad is a pretty handy solution for a lot of people. And the final one that I wanted to talk about is one called Pond5. Now, Pond5 is a little bit of a different solution. Anybody who knows me, anybody who, one who, anyone who knows me knows that I really like Pond5. I go here to buy, whenever I need audio or video or anything, I go here to get it. And the reason is that it's fast, it's less expensive than all the other guys, and I think they've got a better relationship with creators. Now, what's interesting about Pond5 is that you can sell your own content through Pond5 to people. So let's say that you're gonna go shoot your film in Alaska. <laughs> and what the hell, you're up there, you know, your camera crews arrived a day or two early. I don't know, maybe you should go shoot some extra footage because you can sell it here for, you know, $100, $200. Uh, for a few minutes and you know basically people can buy it over and over and over and over again so and you can sell images that way as well and a lot of times people need those um, images and video in order to do their own works and they need to be able to buy all the rights to that work so they can actually use it in the way that they want to use it so 
Pond5 is a great place to sell content that you create that you want to make available to others for incorporation into their work. Musicians, particularly. If you're the kind of musician that really enjoys just sitting around playing, making up songs by yourself, I mean, if you just have music running in your head all of the time, and you're looking for a way to sell that music in, and earn more than a dollar or two per song, you know, you can earn 20 or $30 per song here. And, and you, can, you can ask people, you know, credit me when you, if you use this in your movie and your video. They may or may not do it, but it's not going to hurt. And the thing is, you still retain ownership of the work. You're just licensing people to use it. So Pond5 is a cool place for you to sell um, content. And it's something for, you know, most people should really think about if, if they are shooting video, shooting still images, or shooting um, or, or recording audio of any kind. Now, I mentioned in passing, so those are all the ones, those are all the sites that I'm going to review right off the bat. But if you look at the notes that go with this video, you'll see that there's pages and pages and pages that talk about other ways to sell books. For example, I talk about ACX, which is a division of Amazon, which lets you sell audio books. You can also use Bandcamp to sell audio books. So you may decide to take your script and turn it into an audio book. Uh, there's other ways to sell video. There's, for example, if you produce your film and you can't find another distributor for it, you can use distributor.com to make it available on Hulu, Netflix, uh, and cable pay-per-view. There's uh, a whole bunch of other places that let you sell products. And I review here, once again, um, Product Fundamentals, which talks about the basic making sure you have the right intellectual property rights and making sure that when you hire people as an artist or something, you don't lose the right, you know, the fact that they've drawn your character means they own that version of the character, which is if you're not careful when you work with an artist, they, you're giving them the right to produce that image. They, you have to make sure that you have a good contract with them. This reviews the apps. This talks about ways to sell your music video and images. Um, it talks about other competitors to, to Pond5. So that pretty much covers everything that uh, I want to talk to you about merchandising and monetizing your content. The most important thing to remember is that you're creating intellectual property and it should be working for you all the time. A lot of times people think, well, I'm going to produce just this content and they have a very narrow idea of the way to exploit that intellectual property. But it's really crazy. Smart people, people that are successful in the entertainment industry or successful as authors, sell their work across a wide variety of media. Stephen King didn't stop at just writing stories that got put in magazines. He, some, he bundled up those short stories and turned them into books. And then he sold, had his agents and so forth sell the rights to those to become movies. It's think in terms of all the different ways your intellectual property can be sold. And if you do, you'll be a much, much more successful um, creator and a much more successful artist because you'll have more freedom, financial freedom, to do the kind of work that you really want to do.